is a professor of biomedical engineering and director of the Special Purpose Processor Development Group at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, an AI MBE fellow and an IEEE Life Fellow. He received his BS degree in electrical engineering from Purdue and a PhD in biomedical engineering from University of Minnesota and Mayo Clinic. Since 1970, his research interests have been in the design of hardware for specialized supercomputers. His team has designed more than 450 integrated circuits and has contributed to the development of more than two dozen special purpose computers from chip sized processors to cabinet sized supercomputers. Barry grew up in an investment oriented family where he absorbed information regarding the stock markets and other forms of investments. Since 1975, he has been an active investor and has developed a safe approach to investing that has worked well, which he will describe in this talk. So with that, let's give uh, Dr. Gilbert a uh, warm uh, virtual welcome. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Darren. Um, so it turns out that I have a missing setting on my desktop machine, so I can't share my screen. Sanaya and I worked this out a couple of weeks ago. So either Darren or Sanai will move the screen, will move to the next slide when I ask. So that's, whoops. Okay, first one. Okay, go to the next one. Nope. Next. Back one, yeah, okay. Uh, is that the second one, Darren? Yeah, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, Sanai has the tech on okay. her machine. Sorry, one second. I don't know why it's not letting me. I think that's oh. this should be your your next one. Uh go to the go to what you think is the next one. We'll just start in. Oh. Sorry, it's not. Uh, no, no. That one. Uh, yeah, let's okay. Let's go with that. So Sorry, folks. Um, wow. Okay, that was an interesting start. So this seminar series, I assume, is typically an engineering seminar series where you where you hear that kind of material. And this particular seminar is definitely not a contribution to the engineering component of what you folks usually hear. So why why am I offering a non-engineering presentation? to folks like you who are either MS or PhD students or recent postdocs. So, so first I'm gonna start with a little bit of background. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So I've led, as, as uh, Darren pointed out, I've led a, a pretty good sized engineering team. I think we're currently just a few below 50 since 1971 and I've noticed again and again, that none of the folks working with me ever received any formal training during their university's years talking about how to invest uh, in the markets or invest at all. And I have to say, neither did I when I was an undergraduate at Purdue and a graduate student at University of Minnesota. So what's going to happen is you folks will complete your university training or perhaps have already completed it uh, with the skills and knowledge base that employers will need to keep their companies going. But I've learned by experience that engineers should also have skills and knowledge that they need or that you folks will need to, to solidify your, your own future, future financial security. 
um, you're going to be well paid by your companies. Uh, by your companies. As, as an example, uh, undergraduates uh, in engineering programs generally earn about 80% more than their liberal arts colleagues. And so you, have, you will have funding right from the beginning. So why not use some of that money uh, from your earnings to strengthen your own long-term financial situation? So with this talk, which may now be a little bit shorter, I guess we're kind of a little bit late. Um, I want to introduce you to tools and, and approaches that will allow you to invest safely in the stock markets on your own while avoiding the huge number of financial traps that in, novice investors fall into. I've watched that happen. Uh, I watched a colleague of mine essentially completely taken to the cleaners and it was heartbreaking. And I'm trying to avoid those sorts of things by, by giving you information. The, the full series is much longer. This is really a kind of a teaser trailer, just so that you see where the full presentation set would go. Uh, next slide, please. Oop. Oop. Okay, so I think that's the next slide. The following slides will give you a very high level overview of the, of the, of the process. Um, how to invest safely and for the long term. Get rich quick is worse than a myth. It's it's a cruel joke. You can't get rich quick. You can get poor very quickly. And if you follow if you follow the the news at all, there are lots of examples of people people getting poor very quickly. Um, you have to get rich slowly and carefully. So a minimum five to ten year investment time horizon is really is really required. And by starting early, you folks will actually have that. So in this one hour talk, I can't give you enough information to begin in investing in detail, not enough detailed information to begin investing, but the full series will be presented if there's, if there's sufficient interest and we'll talk more about what would be in that full series later. Okay, next slide, please. Oop, one too far. No, it needs to be two. I'm sorry. Let me um, see if I can re-download this because okay. I think the problem is going to keep happening where I um, where it keeps skipping slides. So bear with me. Sure. So I think what I'm going to do is share it from here. Um, and this will. Oh, OK, me... OK, OK. That, that'll, that'll is this that'll good? Work. Yeah. OK. Slightly different uh, visual format, but it's fine. So I hope everybody can see that. All right. So this is slides that says background dash two. So as I mentioned, and as Darren mentioned, I've worked my entire career uh, as a research and development engineer. Uh, I have a. PhD in biomedical engineering from University of Minnesota, BS degree from Purdue. Uh, and I taught engineering for 25 years until we moved to a far off off campus building and nobody wanted to trek out to there. So I stopped teaching and I wasn't able to get downtown. So I'm an IEEE fellow um, and that's my engineering background. But the thing that's relevant for this discussion is I was raised in an investment oriented family. So my father was a financial advisor for the clients of what is known, what is, was known as a mutual life insurance company, which meant that the insurance company was owned by the people themselves who were customers or clients. So it was completely, uh, it was not for profit. It was not an insurance company for profit. So that gave my father a unique position to be able to advise people without any financial overhead or axes to grind or whatever. So I learned this stuff at the dinner table from the time I was about 11 years old until I left home to go to, to Purdue. And I've subsequently learned quite a bit more on my own. So I've been an active investor since 1975. 
uh, from 75 to 81. Then I made a few changes in the way I was doing it. And I've continued along that path. But the process has worked very well for me and for my family. Okay, next, and I. Okay, so everything I'm going to tell you in this one hour teaser trailer, and everything, almost everything that I'm going to tell you if we do the full multi part series, uh, is based on my own direct experience. Um, I'm going to present a method, method, set of methods that work very well for me for more than 40 years that is based on specific investment newsletters, as they're called, that, that are just, you know, you just get a subscription to the newsletter and it appears in your electronic inbox or in your paper inbox uh, once a month. And they've been available for a very long time, since 1980, and they have excellent reputations. There used to be a rating agency for, uh, for newsletters, the, that has, has uh, aged out. But the newsletters that I'm going to be talking to you about ranked in the top three or four consistently year after year. I tried a series of newsletters over about a 15 year period. There are a lot of really bad ones out there, and I can tell you that. So you'll be able to invest by selecting individual companies yourself from the lists provided in these newsletters and then applying the investment tools that I will describe in detail in the full set of talks. And I'll just touch on those uh, uh, today. I will, in the full set of talks, comment on a few alternate approaches that I've not used myself personally, but appear financially sound to me, although I think they have lower year over over year returns, and I think I understand why. They're not terrible at all. I think they're just not quite as good. Next slide. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is mechanics. Um, I've read a number of of investment books. And one of the things that they, I have yet to find one that really talks about the nuts and bolts of investing, the individual steps that a novice investor has to go through to get started and to keep going. So that's what I'm gonna to touch on briefly today and in much greater detail uh, in the full series, which by the way, is around 100 or 110 slides over four or five sessions. Seems like a lot, but I want it to be thorough and complete, um, and it will take a little study, which is which you'll see in a, in a minute. So the first thing I'll touch on is how do you create an account with a brokerage firm, and what does that mean, and an example of a brokerage to work with. That is by far the most important step. You're absolutely handcuffed until you have done that step, but it's a fairly easy step, particularly for folks like you who are really uh, computer and, and, and uh, internet savvy. Uh, and then an introduction to how investment newsletters work, not all of them, but just a small handful that I'll talk about. And then how to, inv how to select individual um, companies from their lists. Um, and that also will include talking about how you invest online. Um, when one of, the one of the companies that I will be talking about, Charles Schwab, uh, went online in 1997, that, and I guess the other uh, companies that I haven't used, uh, went online. It changed the investing uh, horizon for private investors big time. It was a big investment change. And I think a lot of, a lot of people have, thousands, millions of people have taken advantage of that, and I have certainly. So, and then how to monitor your portfolio. Here it says online. In the full presentation, I will show that. Here I'll Give you a couple of ways of, of doing it which are not necessarily online and then i want to do even in this talk an initial discussion of traps and pitfalls it is so easy to get exploited taken to the cleaners whatever words you want to use and it's relatively easy to avoid those traps and pitfalls if you recognize if you have something that gives you the information to recognize them when they're being being stuck under your nose so this approach can improve your financial stability, but you have to have a, a fairly lengthy uh, event horizon, at least five years, 10 years is better. I've been doing this since the late 70s. And even if you commit small amounts of money, but continually over a period of time, it'll allow you to participate in the system. And you can start with as little as 100 or $200 and just, and just 
try things. You will make mistakes. You are guaranteed to make some mistakes because uh, there are a lot of details. And, and at first, some of the details will not be obvious. Certainly, I made mistakes in the early years. And from time to time, I still make a mistake. Um, but it's all right. If you start small, the mistakes won't hurt you very much. Next slide, Sinai. Okay, so investment implementations that work. It requires some maintenance invest, inve uh, maintenance effort from, from you folks. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So I'm going to be talking about newsletters. Why rely on a few, <coughs> pardon me, uh, why rely on a few carefully selected investment newsletters? Because no single individual, particularly folks in our business, can commit the time to investigate a range of individual stocks or stock mutual funds, and no single individual has the computer power and or the trained analysts to sort through the thousands of possibilities. New York Stock Exchange alone, I think, lists 5,500 stocks. When I started out, if I haven't said this before, when I started out, my father had shown me how to do stock, individual stock picking. But by the time I got to the point where I had a little money, I didn't have the time to do that. And so that's why I look for an alternate approach, which is these investment newsletters. And, and during about a 15 year period, I subscribed um, for periods of a year or two or three to 12 or 15 newsletters. And I found there are a lot of them out there that are really not very good. So the three that I have finally settled on and that I continue to use are the ones that I'm going to mention. Um, so that's a, a very reliable shortcut because the folks who run those, uh, I'll talk about Navalier. He uses powerful computer programs that have been under development for 40 years or more. And uh, Morningstar, which uses a whole suite of trained analysts who pick through the stocks essentially manually, although again, I think they use some computer power. Next slide, please. Okay, the investing newsletters that I use, and I'm gonna talk, actually there are a couple that I use that I'm not gonna talk about here because they require even more personal time. And I'm just wanting to give you folks kind of a, a small number that, that you can use. So um, the stock selecting and fund selection newsletters that I that have multi-decade -de excellent track records are <clears throat> morning. First one I'll talk about is Morningstar Stock Investor. It uses an approach called value investing. This is the same approach that has made Warren Buffett a multi-billionaire. Uh, they work very well in times of low national infl of national inflation, but they require a pretty long event horizon, five to 10 years, the very low stock turnover. And as you will see in a, in a minute or two, there are two sub portfolios within Morningstar Stock Investor, one which is called the tortoise, which is a little bit more conservative and a little bit slower moving, and one called the hare, which is a little less conservative and a little faster moving. <clears throat> but in fact, both of them use value investing. So that value investing means that they concentrate on best on the best invest in individual stocks with steady long-term growth potential over a period of say five to 10 years. And I'll talk about, I'll give you a, a snapshot of one of the pages uh, from, from a stock investor in a minute. Uh, the second one, which is also by Morningstar also uses the value investing approach uh, is a mutual fund List, listing. And a mutual fund is a combination of individual stocks in a specific industry, clothing manufacturers, uh, automobile manufacturers, steel manufacturers, whatever. Um, and they're all listed out. And so Morningstar's fund investor lists what they believe in. It's, they're subcategorized, but what they believe is the 500 best mutual funds. So that gives you an indication of how many mutual funds there are out there. And I would argue that you have to rely on an organization which has the clout to pick through several thousand mutual funds and find the 500 best. Okay. And I will not show you a page of that in, in this particular talk, but I will show you a page in, in uh, Stock Investor. And then the third one is Navalier Growth Investor. 
He uses a growth investing portfolio, which actually was, was developed uh, by an individual who won a Nobel Prize for his approach to investing oh, probably 50 years ago. Um, and this particular uh, investment newsletter follows growth, which means they, they, they look for companies that experience rapid growth over perhaps a one to two year period. And it works very well, particularly in times of high national inflation, but it's worked very well for me now for 25, 25 years. Um, there's more buying and selling uh, of individual stocks than with Morningstar. And once in a while, they will sell a stock with a loss. You have to be prepared if you use growth invest, Navler growth investor, that once in a while, he will cut his losses. He will say, our computer programs thought that this stock was going to go up, but some of external event has made the stock go down. It's not worth holding it any longer. The risk is too great. And he, he, uh, he um, issues a sell order. And so you just sell the stock and take the loss and use that to compensate for, for gains at the end of each calendar year. Um, you have to do this a little more frequently than for Morningstar. You have to look at your portfolio. You have to read the, the uh, newsletters that he sends out weekly. There's a monthly newsletter where he presents new buys and sells, but he also sends uh, weekly newsletters. That's, again, why you have to give your email addresses, because these days, of course, stuff is sent that way. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. Okay, next slide. So here's a snapshot from the Morningstar tortoise portfolio. It's not the whole thing. If I were to run it, it would go all the way down to the floor of this room and probably down through the, through the floor into the next room. So there are probably around 40 or 50 or 60 stocks listed. So I just snapshotted it. Um, so let's take the very first one, which is Berkshire Hathaway. That's, that's Warren Buffett's company. Um, so the first column with the star, the star rating column there can be some stocks that they rate with as many as five stars, but you don't see that very often. Typically, the highest number of stars is four stars. So Berkshire Hathaway, when I took this snapshot, was four stars. And then I'm going to skip some of the columns here, and I'm going to go over to the column that says current price. So at the time I took this snapshot, the price per share for Berkshire Hathaway was about $286. Now, <clears throat> the Morningstar staff rates the value of this stock with a higher per share value. They're saying it may be selling for $285.77 uh, now, but we, they, think that the stock is probably worth about $320 a share. So the next column over to the right, which is P over FV, is price per fair value. So if you buy something from, from one of these lists, you want to buy, buy a stock that has a price to fair value below 1.0. So for example, Oracle is 1.37, which means they think, the, the, the people who, who are working at Morningstar, they think effectively from their perspective that at the time this snapshot was taken that the stock was really overvalued. So you wouldn't buy, you wouldn't buy uh, anything that has uh, 1.0 or greater. And you see eBay is 1.16 and, and so on all the way down. So that's the way this particular portfolio looks. There are other columns. I can go into those in more detail in the longer presentation. So now let's move on. I'm not going to show you here one of the here. I think I'm going to move on. Yeah, here's the Nav Navalier growth portfolio. And he has uh, four different subcategories, conservative stocks, and he says you should have 60% of your investment with his portfolio, 60% in conservative stocks, 30% in, in moderately aggressive, and 10% in aggressive. And I'm not showing you those other two because, again, uh, the, the sheet would run down through the floor of this room. So on the far left it's a, is the, the ticker symbol that the stock goes by uh, at the at the exchanges it goes by uh, in, in the um, uh, oh I blanked in in the uh, uh, investment companies that you're going to work with um, so if we look at 
cadence design systems here, which we all know. So over here, all the way over, so he had a buy date. Over here is the buy price. This is what they paid for the stock when they bought it. And if you go over to recent price, you can see what it's selling now. But the other final column on the far right, which is the most important, is the buy below price. So you never want to buy a stock from Navalier's portfolio list where the stock is currently running at above its buy below price. He's saying that's the top. Anything beyond that, you're overpaying for the, for the stock. And so you see that he has these grades. You try to go for the A's and the B's. But I will tell you that he is very good in his, they are very good in their newsletter uh, month on a monthly basis of telling which, uh, which stocks should be purchased now at the time of that release of the newsletter and which stocks should be sold. He always tries to sell at a profit, but as I said earlier, there are times that he'll just take the hit, sell, sell at a loss and say, well, you know, we didn't do so well on that one. But I will tell you that over the years, his wins far exceed his, his losses. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so what is a brokerage account and how do you open an account? As I said, I'm using Charles Schwab as the example. Uh, they are terrific. They have very, very good, good to excellent phone service. You call a number. I've long since memorized it. On one occasion, for a bizarre reason, I needed information at two o'clock in the morning. I called up, and it was the, the call was answered on the first ring. They're always there uh, for their for their clients and their customers. Uh, they have an excellent, very well designed and very well implemented website. It's it's really terrific. And so, as I said, I've used six brokerages over the years, but I've and I still use more than one. But I concentrate all of my all of my holdings and investing. Uh, through Schwab. So you need to work with these companies, which are brokerages. They're companies that perform trades in the stock markets for you. You can't do it yourself. Um, I've dealt with, as I said, six. Um, I'm using Schwab as the example. Uh, what is a brokerage account? It allows you to buy and sell or in the parlance trade a variety of investments, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, index funds, even exchange traded funds or ETFs. And the money that you put into that, either by sending a check once you have an account uh, or by electronic funds transfer, which is a little bit harder to set up, but better over the long run, which is Schwab has a mechanism of letting you connect your checking account or your savings account electronically to your Schwab investment account. And then you can, you can do electronic, electronic funds transfers to move money in either direction for that matter, uh, but mostly from your sources of money uh, into your account. And that works really very well. Once you get it set up, it's 15 seconds to move a chunk of money. Um, the, uh, but it's your money, so you can do whatever ever you want with it. But the easiest way to open the brokerage account is online. Uh, the, the, uh, the URL is down there at the bottom. Um, it's about a 10-page form, but not to fear. Uh, most of the items on the 10 pages are, are box clicks, box checking. Um, you have to give them your email address because that's their preferred way of communicating and quickly because they really respond very quickly. Or if they have new information, they fire that message off to the email addresses of, of their clients. Or you can call them by telephone. I told you on one occasion, I called them at two o'clock in the morning because I was not at home. I wanted to do a trade. I didn't have a computer so I just called them. I thought, oh, they're not going to answer. And they did and did the trade for me over the telephone. So they're really good to work with. Um, that's what a brokerage account is. Um, okay, next slide. All right, now this, you have to decide how much you want to want to commit at any given time, total cash. And then you want to figure out how many different companies are you going to purchase shares from uh, based on the newsletter tables that I showed you already. So this is an example. This is a, just a, a simple Excel, Excel spreadsheet. Um, so far left is the ticker symbol, three, one or two or three or four letter ticker symbol. Uh, so FTNT in this example is Fortinet, or maybe I should use KEYS Keysight, which you guys probably know as a company. 
Um, and then there's a column that says cost per share. Well, where do you get the instantaneous cost per share? You go to your browser and in the search box at the top, you type the ticker symbol, either F or K-E-Y-S or F-T-N-T or whatever it is, followed by the two words share price. And you hit return and bang, up comes the most recent share price. If you do this in the middle of a workday, the share price is updated, I don't know, every 100 milliseconds, something like that. If you do it on a weekend, then you're going to get the closing share price when the market's closed at the end of the trading day on, on Friday. So that's how you get the cost per share. And then you have to figure out how much you want to pay uh, for, each, for each purchase. So that's the target cost. They don't have to all be the same. Here I just said 500, 500, 500, but it could be 500, 750, uh, 2,500, it's whatever you want. And then <clears throat> the spreadsheet calculates, as I've worked it out, the number of shares that you'll end up to about six decimal places. So if I take the top one, Fortinet, and the cost per share from the internet was $333.83, and my target cost was $500, it said that I needed, I could buy 1.4977 blah, blah, blah number of shares. Well, you're not going to do that. So you either round up the number of shares or you round down the number of shares. So what you've seen in this case is that I've rounded the first one up, I've rounded the second one down, and I've rounded the third one down just a little bit. And then the predicted cost over there is the total. Now, this is the set of numbers that you plug in. This is not the set of numbers that you will ultimately get back when the trades execute because the stock prices change uh, millisecond by millisecond, but it will be close. It'll be close. So maybe within, you know, $10 or $100 or $300 or whatever, but the, the price that you will get per share, the total price is going to be with those and the price per share will probably be within a few dollars plus or minus. Once in a blue moon, you will see that a stock price, the stock price per share jumps five or ten dollars uh, in the few instances that it takes, a few uh, milliseconds that it takes for the trade to to to, to execute. But it's it's usually pretty close. Next slide, please. All right. Now this is what is called a trade ticket. It's a little hard to read. Yeah, thank you for zooming in. It's a little bit hard to read. So you can do up to eight orders at a time. That's kind of that's kind of much to see on a, on a small screen. So I usually do two or three, or if I'm really feeling adventurous, I'll do four. But you, they're down at the bottom off the screen now. You can click to add, add more, more windows. Uh, see, down at the bottom, it says add order. And every time you click it, you'll get another one of these. So now we can just pick as long as it stopped here. So it's okay. Just stop. Okay. So if you take order number one, uh, PSX, which was Philip 66, and you can choose what you're going to do. Typically, it's a stock or an ETF. This is a pull down. So there are other things that you can do, but I'm not going to go into that. I'm just saying, so I picked stock because it's, it's a stock. Um, and then I marked it buy. It could have been sell if I'm trying to sell a stock. But there are other options besides buy. And again, I can't go into those now, but that's also a pull down. And then the number of shares. Well, I put in one share for this example but it could be anything that you think uh, you want. But the thing that's important here is they immediately calculate the estimated amount. So once in a while, you'll make a mistake. You'll, you'll mean to type, let's say, quantity 10, and your fingers will stutter, and you'll accidentally type in quantity 1,000. And what will pop up here is an, a huge number, far bigger than you would have expected, and that's a clue that you made a mistake. So then you can go back and take a look and make whatever modifications you want. So this is the first page of a two-page trade ticket, as it's called. Um, and you'll get that. You'll, you'll see where do you get these trade tickets? Well, in the full set of talks, I will show you that at the top of the main screen, you'll see a number of, of uh, options to click. And one of the options says trade. So you click on that, and then it gives you some sub options but eventually you'll get to the point where you get a trade ticket and then you can add extra trade tickets. So that's, that's why I'm saying 
There's many more slides in the full presentation. I'm just trying to give you a really quick high level uh, overview. So let's go to the next slide, which is the confirmation part of the trade ticket. Yep, oh, yep, yep, yep. Okay, so this is the, oh, oh, too far. Uh, this is an example of the review orders page. So it's the same stocks in the previous thing. So there's Philip 66, and it's giving me the information again that I typed in in the previous chart. It's giving the it's giving the person who's making the purchase or making the trade the option of checking one last time to make sure there are no mistakes. You will make mistakes. I will give you an example. This is probably the worst mistake that I ever made, but it's it's characteristic of the sorts of things that can happen. Not very often, and the more experienced you become, the more experienced you become the more likely it is that you will not make mistakes or that you will catch mistakes uh, before it's in quotes too late. So what did I do? I was buying a stock uh, for my son who was in his late teens or early twenties there then. And it, the stock that I wanted to buy had a four character ticker symbol. So I typed the ticker symbol into, into the trade ticket page. What I didn't recognize is that I had reversed the second and third letters in the in the four letter uh, stock ticker symbol. And so when I checked it, it looked okay to me. So I clicked, I clicked buy and it bought it. The thing that hurt was that by the purest coincidence, that particular interchanged ticker symbol actually had a stock. There was a stock associated with that. So I'd ended up buying a stock and I looked at the, at the thing and said, I don't even know what company that is. So what I did then was I immediately sold it. Well, that was a bad thing to do. That was a tr what is called a trade violation. And Schwab slapped my hand. They had to, the Federal Trade Commission made them. They slapped my hand very hard and said, okay, your account is closed for three months. And that really hurt. So it's, it really pays to check over what you've done so that you make sure that you don't, now that's a pretty rare mistake, but it, you have to check to make sure that you haven't made a mistake. You will, and sometimes you just have to eat the mistake. Okay, next slide. Okay, now here's an example of a spreadsheet that I put together um, that says, this is so you can keep track of your stock transactions. So. Uh, this is an old, old spreadsheet that I put together many years ago. I don't have to do it this way now for reasons that I'll explain in a minute, but it's perfectly valid. Um, so I have purchases on the left side. I have uh, it's it's I have sells. It says sales. I mean sells. So here's Apple. So here's the purchase. These are all plugged in by hand. Here's the purchase date. Here's the number of shares I purchased. Here's the price per share at the time I purchased them. Here was the total uh, total purchase price, $1,328.80. And then about a year later, I sold the shares. Uh, I sold all the shares. I didn't have to. I could have sold part of the shares. Sale date, number of shares sold, price per share at the time. So it was $137.34 when I sold, as opposed to, as opposed to $66.44 when I bought them. So there's the total sale price. So the total gain or loss was a positive, was a gain of $1,018. So you can do that. You can set up your own Excel spreadsheet. Uh, on the other hand, and this is why I say this was done many years ago, the Schwab people continue to update their website. So it requires some continual learning curve. They, they're just getting, getting better and better. The Schwab website now has tools that will do this for you. So once you have an account and you start doing buys and sells, it'll take some poking around on the Schwab website, but you will find that there are places where you can see exactly what I've shown you here, exactly what I, well, the format looks a little different, but it's the same content. And so that's a, another way to do it, which is more automated than this. And then the other thing is if for those of you who use Quicken for all your other transactions, Quicken does a really good job if you create a brokerage account template uh, in Quicken, and you keep it up to date, Quicken itself will compute a number of these things for you. And that works very well. So what do I do? I actually do both. 
because I believe in the belt and suspenders approach. Um, I don't use this, this kind of spreadsheet anymore. It's kind of obsolete for me, but it works. Next slide, please. Okay, so now a few informational items. Um, keep it simple. Don't get fancy. Getting fancy will get you into trouble. And there are lots and lots of examples of that for little guys, for medium-sized guys, for big guys and gals, I should say. Don't, don't do that. It'll get you in trouble. Keep it simple. Buy only common, not preferred stock shares. And by the way, in the Schwab trade ticket, they assume that you're buying common shares. I'm not even going to talk about the difference between common and preferred uh, in, in, at, this, at this point. You have to tell the Schwab trade ticket separately if you want to buy preferred shares of a company rather than common. Just stick with common. It works just fine. Um, corporate bonds are not a particularly good investment in today's environment. I can't take the time to go into why that's the case. Uh, mutual funds, for example, as rated by the Morningstar Fund Investor Newsletter are, are okay. You have to be a little careful, uh, but they give you lots of information to read. But you'll get a little bit lower return over time because the fund managers and every one of the, every one of the funds listed in their list of 500 has people who watch those funds, watch the, the individual stocks that are in the funds, but they have to get paid too. So they skim a little money off of the, the positive trades and that lowers your growth potential by a little. So that's just a little bit of a warning. Um, it's not the end of the world. If people want to use funds instead of individual stocks, it's certainly, it's certainly okay, but use Morningstar Fund Investor because they really do a primo job of finding um, the, the best funds and they list them by subcategory, which makes it easier. They don't just pile them all in. They go by, by individual, uh, individual industries and so on, as I think I mentioned earlier. Okay, index funds, um, like the St Standard & Poor's 500 index funds, fund, they have very low uh, fees, but they appreciate more slowly over time than individual stocks, and they need a long time horizon. Uh, Warren Buffett has shown for years and years and years that his approach will beat the Standard & Poor's 500, that's the 500 stocks in that particular index, that his, will, his approach will beat the S&P 500, and Navalier beats the S&P 500 by even more. So I don't use index funds. I'm just telling you that they exist. And you can do that through the Schwab brokerage if you want to. I don't recommend it, but it's not the end of the world. Okay, and the last, uh, the last presentation, which frankly I have not written yet because I'm going back and forth in my head as to whether you folks will actually need this uh, early on, is you may need to pay quarterly estimated taxes if your earnings in a give in the prior year exceeded some level, which depends on which, which tax bracket you're in. So it's a little complicated. If you use a, a, a tax preparer, the tax preparer can help you with this. This is not obviously on your salary. This is on what you make in uh, uh, through your investments. Uh, and I will talk about that a little bit. If it, it, I'll talk with, with Darren about this a little, if we give the full presentation to see whether I should do that or not. Uh, next slide. Okay, traps to avoid, a warning. Investment approaches to use with care or not at all. Robo-advisors, that's a different word for computer programs. Um, Robo-advisors robo were very popular uh, two or three years ago. They've kind of fallen out of favor. The problem with those computer programs is they do very well at stock picking when the market is increase, is rising. They, are, they have been shown to do not nearly as well when the market is, is, is falling. And so that's why they were all, uh, a lot of people were gung-ho to use robo-advisors a couple of years ago. Schwab offered that service, but frankly, they've stopped advertising it on their internal website. They still have it, but they're not talking about it very much. It, it just turned out not to be as good as everybody thought it would. Then there are fad and meme stocks, you know, like what you see in the Wall Street Journal or what you see on Fox News or CNN, oh, buy this particular stock because it's going to go through the roof, or that's a fad stock, or everybody's buying this stock, so you should buy it. That's a meme stock. Don't, don't go there because those, 
stocks go up and down, like they, they bounce like tennis balls, up and down, up and down. Cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum, this has been in the news a lot lately. Um, it's basically uh, a concept based on the greater fool theory. They have no intrinsic value. They have no product. They have no customers. They have no sales. They have no positive income. You're just, you're just betting that somebody else that you want to sell your Bitcoin to will be a greater fool than you were and will, in fact, pay your price. And that's the way it goes. So uh, one person buys and sells to another person who buys and sells to another person. But there's, there's nothing underlying. And a number of really prominent people, both in government and uh, in the brokerage houses, have said Bitcoin is, is just a scam. Gold in any form. Uh, gold in the late 1970s was a very good investment for about three years, and it hasn't been really since. You can do it, but you're not going to get much appreciation on your value. value. And then there are a couple that I'm going to just name quickly, but I'm not, I don't have time to talk about them. Trading on margin, which you can do it through Schwab. Short selling, which you can do through Schwab. Uh, options trading, which you can do through Schwab. Or bond mutual funds. All of these have major, major problems. And you can really get taken to the cleaners. And there's no need to do this because you folks will all have, you will all have the event horizon time to do it carefully and slowly and with forethought and by following the small number of organizations that do a really good job with this. Treasury securities in any form. So that would be 30-year treasury bonds, one-year treasury bills. They're very safe. They're backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. They have very low return rates. Has there ever been a time when, when buying treasury bonds was a good idea? Yes, early 1980s for about four or five years and really not since. So safe, but a very, very low return on your investment. So I don't recommend that anymore. Exchange traded funds. I used to use these up until about 10 or 12 years ago. They are <clears throat> aggregates of stocks in particular submarkets. And they used to work very well. As I said, I had exchange traded funds. But then the people who ran the funds, the fund managers, thought they were going to be very clever. And they started gaming the system, gaming their own system at the expense of the private individuals who were using their ETFs. And so you can get soaked. And in fact, their time frames for, for doing changes in the prices per share of the funds are milliseconds and none of us can function on millisecond time scales. So if this, if a exchange traded fund bounces up a little bit and you try to sell it, they will buy it from you, but at, at a slightly lower price than they can get as the big guys. And so you get a little bit soaked and they do this again and again. And the last thing which may surprise you is a warning and that is professional investment advisor, advisors such as my father used to be decades ago, have, have, have changed. They're really now primarily working for themselves. And that's not something that you, that you really want. And we'll see a little bit more of that in the next slide. I think the, I think the next slide may be the last one. Oh, no. So here, this is, this is a, a list of what the individual um, future uh, seminars can be if there's enough interest. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to give that. And if Darren finds out that there is sufficient interest, then we'll work out when we'll do these sessions. And I'm perfectly happy to do it because I just want you guys to do well. So also, I will point out a couple of books which describe alternate approaches that I don't use, but from reading about them, they seem okay to me. And I will talk about those in the full set of presentations. Next slide. Okay, so I think this is final comments. So all of you can do this. You need a little bit of time and effort for learning curve, but you've learned attention to detail because of the way your engineering curricula, curricula have gone. You have an understanding of technical topics for the same reason. <clears throat> you have computer and network literacy for sure. You will have a future significant cash flow. And if you start soon, you have a long time horizon. I say five to 10 years, but frankly, 15 or 20 is better. Don't live paycheck to paycheck. 
a lot of a lot of engineers engineers that I know live paycheck to paycheck. Don't do that. Just don't do that. Save and invest a percentage of every one of your paychecks, and you can choose a cash flow split. This is one that I that I found someplace. It's not mine. I'm just re repeating it here. So 60% of your take home pay for necessities, 20% for things you want, 20% for investing, or some other similar ratio that you're comfortable with. But the 20% investing cannot go to zero. Do not let that happen to yourself. Time commitment, the first year, I'd say two to three hours per month because you have a learning curve to go through. But subsequently, probably one hour a month will, will suffice as you get adept at doing this kind of thing. And, and remember, every hour that you commit, every hour that you commit is an hour that you're working for yourself, not for your employer, and not paying a middleman, an investment advisor who's actually working for himself. I think that's the last slide. Yep. Okay. So uh, Sanai asked me whether I would take questions. I will be happy to take questions, but I will say I cannot and will not answer questions about individual companies or individual trades, anything of that sort, because that's really outside my, my purview. I should not be doing that. I really need to be doing the kinds of presentations that I have. So you can ask any procedural questions that you want or ask any question. If I feel I can't answer it or shouldn't answer it, I'll say so. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilbert. That was wonderful. Uh, do we have questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, are you, uh, hypothetically, if you uh, continue this five-part series you mentioned, um, are you going to cover you know, how you should split up uh, percentage wise, you know, your investment money and in personal investments, like the stocks you talked about versus like retirement accounts, like Roth IRAs and such? Um, a little bit, but not a great deal. I need to keep it high. I, my answer to you is I need to keep it kind of high level, but I, I can talk a little bit about that. I won't put it into the talks, but if you, if you, if we do the full presentation and you ask that as a question, I'm not sure Darren, should people send me emails or do they want to just speak out the way this gentleman is? I don't know how to do that yet, but I'll, I'll do my best, but I, I have to be careful and not overstep my bounds. Yeah, you know what we could do is uh, send a Google sheet to the participants in this event and we can kind of collect some feedback, yep. um, which could include uh, questions. Yep. Okay. Okay, thank you, sounds good. Barry, I have a I have a question now that that might interest the the group. Um, could you make a comment on life stage and how one's portfolio could uh, might evolve over time? Yeah. So there is there is there is an approach which is called target date funding, target date funds. Um, Schwab offers target date funds with a variety of boundary conditions and parameters. And what that approach is says, okay, when I'm young, I can afford to be more adventurous, more aggressive. But as I get older, um, I don't wanna be so aggressive. And so one of the suggestions that you will see not infrequently is as you get older, uh, for every decade of, of age, transfer, 10-ish percent of your money from stocks into bonds or into bond funds. Um, that's pretty common. And the target date fund approach does it for you. They say, what is your target date? When do you want to be done with your investing and essentially reap the cash benefit? When do you want to do that? It could be in 10 years or 15 or 20 or whatever you, you want to set. And then uh, Schwab, for example, has algorithms which will compute how much they should do. And then they will pick the stocks or pick the bonds for you. That's, that's an approach to transferring your wealth. And, and uh, in, in my parents' generation, that was pushed pretty, that approach, not target date funds, but that approach was pushed pretty hard. It's still available. But I remember there was a there was a, a investment program. It's been off the air for many years because uh, its, its proponent passed away. But I remember, and he used to have guest speakers. 
And I remember one man who was 87 years old and uh, his name was, the, the, the person who ran the program was named Louis Rukeyser. And he asked this 87 year old man, is that a good idea? And the guy said, nonsense. I have 100% of my money invested in, in stocks because he said, why do this? You know, you can always cash out the stocks as you need just the same way you'd cash out the bonds and the bonds and bond funds don't have nearly as high a return. This is a guy who's 87 who'd spent his entire life investing for himself and other people. And he said, nah, stay, stay with stocks. So they're, they're, those are the two extremes, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And it's about risk tolerance too. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, we have one more question from uh, Kunal in the chat. Uh, and then uh, I have someone knocking at my door, so I have to I have to run. Um, um, so what are the charges for maintenance of the brokerage account, like maintenance fees, trade charges, etc.? OK, that's a good question. <clears throat> They're exceedingly low. So when you do a buy. Schwab, at least, is charging you nothing to do the trade, nothing to do the buy, nothing. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's $100 or $10,000 for the trade, the charge is nothing. When you sell a stock, the Securities and Exchange Commission does charge, I guess that's how they get some of their operating money, but the charges are like $0.68, cents, $1.23. So Schwab doesn't do that. So you say, well, how does Schwab make its money? Well, typically, almost all, well, everyone who has a private account will have some cash in the account. And they have hundreds of thousands of, of uh, account holders. They take the cash from those accounts and they invest it themselves. And that's where they make their money. So over the years, at one point, they were charging $25 a trade. And then it went down to $15 a trade. Then it went down to $5 a trade. And then it went to zero. And so people said, well, how, are, how is Schwab making its money? They make their money by investing in large quantities of the small amounts of money that those of us who have a little cash in our accounts give them in, in sort of in trust. But there's always enough money that when you need the money, your own money, you know, they have the money there for you. Wonderful, thank you, Barry. And if you have time for one more question from, uh, from Liam, um, uh, he can ask, um, but I unfortunately do have to answer my door now. So thank you again, oh, okay, Barry. But, but, but Sinai, can, can Sinai run this now for a few minutes? Yes, yes. I'm here. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Darren. This has been, I'm, I'm really pleased to have had a chance to talk to folks. Thank you. And I, I learned a lot as well. Okay, thank you. Who had a question? Uh, I, I had one more, if that's all right. Um, I, I was wondering how you manage kind of your own headspace as someone as in the position of, I'm assuming most of the attendees of this talk, um, you know, we feel like we have less knowledge than most of the people using the stock market at this moment. And, you know, from at face value, it seems like it's in a fairly volatile state. You know, a lot of things being said about, you know, growth or decline in, in the next like five years or so. So how do you, you know, I guess, have the courage to start investing at this moment? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, when, I, when I really started doing this seriously, when I, started, when I finished graduate school, by the way, I will tell you that in today's dollars, when I finished graduate school, I was $170,000 in debt. So it was, it was not fun. And I was, I'll use the word frightened. I was a little frightened when I started investing. I probably would have been a little more in frightened, would have been a little more in fright, ah, a little more frightened um, but I had the benefit of hearing at the dinner table from my father. So I had at least a small measure of, of confidence. But what I'm going to try to present in the full four or five part series is enough information for you guys to be able to narrow your, I'll phrase it this way, narrow your focus uh, such that if you follow the recipes that I've put together, that I use myself, every day, every week, I'm gonna make some trades at the end of the day today. And I'm following the same procedures now that I worked out uh, starting back in 1996, 97, and I'm going to pass those along to you. That's why I said in one of the earlier slides, keep it simple, follow these approaches. Uh, you certainly have the opportunity to div 
diverge from them. But once you diverge from them, then from my experience, my learning, you're getting on shakier ground. So at some point, I'm even thinking, I'm, I'm still working full time, but at some point, um, when I retire and have a little more time away from the lab, I may actually write a book on this, but I've got 110 slides already to build this on. And there are a lot of books out there, but as I said earlier, I've never seen one book that presents the nuts and bolts of doing this. And that is what I am trying to do. That's the hole that I'm trying to fill. That's what I think you folks need. That's what I had to work out for myself. And in the early years, I was on the phone to Schwab a lot, not so much anymore. Does that answer your question? If not, please rephrase it or, or tell me what, what else you want me to say and I'll, I'll try to answer. Uh, yeah, no, I think I think you hit it. It's just, you know, you don't wanna, I feel like there's there's a slight fear right now of like, I don't wanna invest, start investing right now. And then, you know, in five months time, there's just massive um, losses in all across the market just because of the current environment. Okay, so let me just make a comment there. <clears throat> I didn't think to check. Uh, I, I checked my Navalier accounts just earlier today, and, and the, 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 uh, my, my Quicken is not up on the screen because all this stuff is up on my screen. But I will tell you that the Morningstar stock investor uh, in aggregate lost, if memory serves, over the last 12 months, which has been, has been probably the worst 12 months in the market since 2008, and some people are claiming you have to go back even farther than that to find a time when the markets were as bad as they've been in the last year. Um, Morningstar stock investor stocks in aggregate lost about five or 6%, but the markets were down 17 to 22%. The, the overall markets were down 17 to 22%. And I will tell you that um, in the Navalier account, uh, he actually eked out about a 5% gain over the last year. Now, that's very atypical for his portfolios. His portfolios are usually 10%, 12%, 15% gain. But even in this terrible last year or 15 months, he was still positive by about 5%. So that's why I say picking really solid newsletters and following the instructions that they give and reading the newsletters whether they come electronically uh, every week and every month from Navalier or whether they come in electronic form and paper form from, uh, from Morningstar, it, it really pays to read those and, and follow what those guys say. That's why I spent 15 years going through newsletters and discarding one after another after another and finally settled on the ones that I use now. Again, that's an answer from my perspective. I don't know whether it answers your specific question. But if you just go in and do things the way everybody else does, you're going to get hurt. If you do things in, in the ways that I'm trying to show you, you may get hurt a little bit, but the chances are much better that you're going to do very well over time. Yeah, that, that addressed it perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so I don't know, Sinai, are you going to, you or Darren going to poll the community 